Hi guys, Drew from Aloha Plant Life here and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be covering a complete care guide for all alocasia. And I am covering alocasia in general as a genus because most of them do have the same basic care requirements. And I will be showing you some of my alocasia that I own as we go along today. Now, in past care videos, I usually have a tendency to say, really, these plants are pretty easy to care for. Not today. Alocasia can be quite tricky. They are one of the trickier plants for me and my personal experience. Experience, which is part of the reason I wanted to put this care guide together for you today. So let's start with the growth pattern for these plants and I am going to grab my Alocasia Bambino here to show you because it's getting a new leaf so that will help us to understand the growth pattern some more. But most Alocasias are going to have these long thin stems and the majority of them will have what's known as an arrowhead shaped leaf such as this. Now as these plants grow in each leaf will produce one new leaf and that's it. Only one new leaf from each and every leaf. And so you can see here on my Bambino, there is a new leaf coming in right here from the previous leaf. Once this leaf unfurls, it will get bigger, it will harden off, and then eventually this leaf will produce one more new leaf. And that's how it always goes. So that can be kind of intimidating sometimes because you might be thinking, well, what if I lose a bunch of leaves? We'll get into that a little bit later. And overall, everything I'm gonna tell you today is gonna help you to have many, many leaves on your alocasias such as I do on this Bambino. Now, when talking about growth pattern, it's also important that I mention that these plants grow from what is commonly often referred to as bulbs, but technically they're not actually true bulbs. What they're really called is corms, which is a swollen type of stem. And as you can see here on my black velvet alocasia, it does have a corm growing off of the base of its stem. And I'm gonna get more into corms later. It comes into play, especially when we get into propagation towards the end of this video. But in terms of growth size for these plants, there are so many different varieties and so many different sizes. You have bambinos like this that stay relatively small. You have alocasia portoras, such as mine outside that I'll flash up on screen here for you that get giant. So all different sizes and all different types, which means lots of variety choices for you. You should be able to find something that would work well in almost any place in your home. So I'm going to go ahead and set this Bambino back aside and let's talk about lighting for these plants. So these plants really want a lot, a lot of bright, bright light. Now, a lot of people will say that they cannot tolerate direct light. However, let's take a quick look at my Alocasia portoras again. So these are on the south side of my house. They get virtually no shade at all during the day in the summer, period. They are in direct sun and they do fine. And that's outside direct sun. Inside direct sun's not even gonna be nearly as harsh as what these are getting exposed to every day. So. I'm gonna stick to my same old rule, which is slowly acclimate your plants to the brightest spots in your house. Just move them in gradually, see how they're behaving. If you're seeing signs that it's too much light for them, back them back off a bit. But mine do fine directly in south windows. They've done directly fine in east windows. And then the Bambino is about a foot back and kind of slightly off to the side from a west window. And that has worked fine for me. I've had no problems with scorching on the leaves or anything like that. But that is what you will see if they're getting too much light. They'll start to get some scorching on them. They can also get super pale and start to turn yellow. And they also could actually actively try to lean away from the light, which brings me into how you'll know if they're not getting enough light. So I actually have not been rotating my Alocasia cupria enough. And that's another thing to think about when you water them, make sure you're rotating them a quarter turn every time you water them because they do like to stretch towards the light. So let me grab my Alocasia cupria real quick and you can see what I'm talking about. Haven't rotated this guy in quite a while. And as you can see, totally leaning this way because that's where the light source was. So I now have him sitting this way, trying to get these leaves to rotate back around, but I just rotated him yesterday. So it's gonna take a while. But if you see a plant bending just really quickly, because it took a while to get to this stage, but if your alocasia is bending really, really far over right away after you rotate it towards the light source, it's probably not getting enough light. And then once again, it could try to bend away from it if it feels like it's too much light. And in general, the greener varieties, because this is a much less green variety, it's more of a coppery color and the backside of the leaves are that kind of reddish color. And so this, plant can do with a little bit less light than the greener varieties, but typically the greener the alocasia, the more light it is gonna need and want. But these are definitely not low light plants, so do not put them in low light situations. You are not gonna have very good luck in that kind of situation. I'm gonna set the cupria back aside and let's talk about watering because I feel like watering is the trickiest thing to get right with alocasias. I think it's the thing that people struggle with the most. And there's a lot of misinformation out there because I've heard a lot of people saying to let them completely dry out in between water and you 
definitely do not want to do that with your alocasia. In their natural habitats, alocasia are in a setting where their soil is more often moist than not. So you definitely don't want to be letting these plants dry completely out ever. I let mine probably dry out about a third of the way before I water them again, but I always look for signs and symptoms that they need water sooner. Now, similar to how you saw the Alocasia cupria was kind of arched forward, that was from it trying to stretch to the light, but when they are thirsty, they will start to droop from the stem like that as well, and you will start to get brown spots, and sometimes they will be brown with a little bit of yellow, which might make you think you've overwatered but they will be crispy. And let me show you what I'm talking about because I did go slightly too long between watering my black velvet alocasia recently. And so I did get some crispiness on the leaf tips. And so this is the kind of thing that you're gonna see if you go too long between watering it. And there's a little bit up here as well. So it is crunchy in texture, it's not mushy. If it was mushy, that would be more of a sign that you might have overwatered. But definitely if I start to see even a little bit of brown on the tips, and I know that it's been a while since I watered this plant, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna water it. I think I probably have never let them get more than halfway dry ever, because once again, they really do wanna be kept a little bit more on the moist side. Now that being said, and this is why watering them can be tricky, they also are highly prone to root rot. So you definitely don't want to be overwatering these plants either. And similarly to prayer plant family plants, alocasia, in my experience, do not really like tap water. The stuff that is in tap water tends to have the same kind of effect on these plants as it does on like Calathea and Maranta. So I would really try to use filtered water if at all possible. If you are a person who uses distilled water for other plants, I would recommend using distilled as well on your alocasias. Now, misting is something I don't usually talk about in these care guides, but I'm gonna bring it up today because a lot of alocasia really do not like to have wet leaves, especially thick velvety leaves, such as this black velvet alocasia, which as you can see, very velvety texture of that leaf. And this leaf is really, really thick. Very, very much so more than the, for example, Alocasia cupria that we looked at. And these leaves just do not like to have water on them. If they have water on them for extended periods of time, they'll start to get mushy. You could start to get fungal issues and parts of the leaf could start to die. And then it could, if it is fungal, spread to the entire leaf and kill the entire leaf. So please avoid misting your Alocasia leaves if at all possible. So soil, let me set this guy back aside and we'll talk about soil because once again, Plants like this that want to be kept more on the moist side but are prone to root rot really have very specific soil requirements that need to be met. So they need a well-draining soil, but one that's also going to retain a bit of moisture. The best way to achieve this is honestly going to be to create your own soil mix, but I realize that's not practical for everyone. So if you can't create a very customized mix, which I'm gonna explain in a second, then your backup plan would be to use a premium potting soil, and you're gonna wanna do about two thirds of that premium potting soil to one third extra drainage, such as perlite or pumice. But if you can make a customized soil mix for them, they would prefer something along the lines of something that's five parts premium potting soil, one part horticultural charcoal, one part perlite or pumice, and then one part cocoa core. Now, a lot of people will use peat moss in place of cocoa core. Peat moss really is not a sustainable ingredient, so I highly recommend that you give cocoa core a try instead. It will also help to retain the moisture, and that is the point of that ingredient in this soil mix. So let's talk about temperature. This plant has a very specific temperature range, and the one thing you do not want to do to your alocasias is let them get too cold ever. They prefer it if you will keep them between about 60 degrees to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and as always, make sure you're avoiding any kind of direct drafts from AC or heat units on your alocasia. And now might actually be a good time to talk about dormancy because these plants can go completely dormant even when grown indoors as a house plant. Now my alocasia portoris that are outside, they definitely go dormant. They're perennials. They die back after the first frost and then they grow back from those corms when springtime rolls around. Now in your house, it is possible for them to die all the way back. It's a little bit rarer though, but one thing that for sure can trigger it to happen is if the plant gets too cold. This past winter, my heat went out downstairs, completely had to replace the entire HVAC system, but I still had heat upstairs. However, when I woke up was when I realized that the heat was out downstairs and it had gotten down to 55 degrees in here. So my Alocasia Tiny Dancer, lost a bunch of leaves. And we're just now starting to put out new leaves for spring and summer here. It lost a bunch of leaves right away. As soon as I woke up, I went and looked at it and the leaves were like melting off because it was just too cold. I immediately moved it upstairs, but 
it stopped growing completely after that happened. And luckily it didn't die all the way back down to the soil, but that can happen too, especially if it's exposed for a long period of time to a cold temperature. So if your alocasia ever die completely back to the base of the soil, do not throw the plant away. The first thing you're gonna wanna do in that situation is check the stem of the plant and the roots of the plant to make sure that the reason it died back to the soil was not a case of rot. If it was a case of rot, then the odds of it coming back or a little bit less, but it still could happen. But if the stem is healthy and the roots are healthy, that means it's just died back to the soil like it would here if it was outside in the winter and it should come back in the spring. So let me grab my Alocasia Bambino again real quick so I can show you what I'm talking about when I say stem. So the stem on an Alocasia is the woody part right where the plant meets the soil. So if you can see up in here, Right here where this plant meets the soil is like a woody-ish texture going down into the soil and then right under there is where the roots and the corm that this particular plant here grew out of. So if all those leaves were to die back and not be there, you could squeeze that stem at the bottom and see if it still feels firm. If it feels firm, that's a good sign. That means the plant should still be healthy. Then you want to slip it out of its pot, look at the roots. If they look white and healthy, you're good to go. In that situation, you're gonna wanna just water the plant just enough to barely keep it moist. You're gonna wanna keep it still in a bright, warm location and just let it be. Come springtime, it should start to bounce back and you should see new growth starting to pop out of that soil. Now, if you go to squish that stem and it's mushy and brown and soft and you slip that plant out of its pot and the roots are brown and mushy and soft, that's a sign that you have root rot. Like I said, it could still bounce back, but there's another thing you could do potentially in that situation, and I will cover that a little bit later when we get to how to propagate these plants. So let's talk about humidity for alocasias. If I'm being honest with you, these plants really do want higher humidity. Think between 60 to 75%. That is their ideal humidity level. The lowest I feel like they can tolerate is somewhere between 40 and 50%. Below that, they'll put up with it for a brief period of time, but for an extended period of time, you're gonna start to see issues. So if you do consistently have lower humidity than 40 to 50 percent, I definitely would recommend using a humidifier for your alocasia. Now I will say that I do find that the thicker leafed varieties of alocasia are way more tolerant towards humidity levels than the thinner leafed varieties. So once again, my alocasia black velvet is very thick leafed. I had zero problems with this plant throughout the winter here. I didn't have it near a humidifier, it did just fine. But my Alocasia cupria, which is a much thinner leaf, still relatively thick, but way thinner than the black velvet Alocasia, it was not having that level of humidity. But even then, I didn't put this one by a humidifier. I actually tried something a little bit different and it worked. So basically every time I took a shower in the evening, I would get out and I would immediately set this plant in the shower enclosure and it's a glass enclosed shower and close the door. And all of that humidity and steam from the shower stays in that enclosure for a longer period of time than if you have like a shower with just a shower curtain where it all just kind of dissipates really quickly. So I would just set this plant in there after I took a shower every night, leave it there until the morning, take it back out. And it did fine. We didn't lose any leaves throughout the winter at all. So that worked for me. That's something you could consider too if you don't have a humidifier or maybe you don't have the money to purchase one right now. So let's talk about fertilizing alocasias. So in general, when alocasias are actively growing, they can be pretty heavy feeders, especially during the spring and summer months when they're starting to grow at a more rapid rate. Additionally, the larger leafed varieties are going to be heavier feeders than the smaller leaf varieties, just because they're bigger plants and they're having to support larger foliage. So in general, year round, unless your plant actually goes completely dormant or dies completely back to the soil, if that doesn't happen, then year round, I recommend recommend fertilizing your alocasias at least once per month. And then when they are actively growing and they're really picking up that growth rate during the spring and summer, I would move into doing it once every two weeks, especially for those larger leafed varieties. Now, as far as what type of fertilizer to use, I use a balanced liquid fertilizer with an NPK of like 20, 20, 20, or a 10, 10, 10 even would work as well. Now, if your plant does die completely back to the soil in the winter, just completely stop fertilizing until springtime rolls around and then just gradually move into it doing it once per month. Once you start to get new growth coming in, you can pick that up to once every two weeks. So what about pests for alocasia? What are the most common pests you're gonna see on these plants? I'm sure many of you have heard that they can be spider mite magnets, and yes, that's true. Spider mites are, in my experience, at least the number one type of pest you're most likely to see on your alocasia. 
The number two would be mealybugs. And those are honestly the top two, at least in my experience, that you're gonna see more often than not on your alocasias. But I'm just curious, if you have had a bigger problem with a different type of pests than that on your alocasias, comment down below and let us know. But in general, alocasias also tend to collect more dust on their leaves because they are typically bigger, broader leaves, except for example, my tiny dancer. But this is a pretty big, broad leaf, and that's a lot of area to collect dust, and dust can attract pests. So it's very important to make sure that you're dusting off the leaves on your alocasia at least once a month. Now, the good news is if they do get pests, it's pretty easy to eradicate them because these are big, broad leaves, and they're very defined stems and there's not a lot of spaces for the bugs to hide. However, at the base of the plant, where those leaves are coming out of each other, those little crevices, that's where they're gonna hide. So when you are treating it for pests, make sure you're paying special attention to those crevices where all of the leaves have been coming out of each other. And when treating these plants for pests, whether it be spider mites or mealybugs or whatever, I would recommend just giving them a good wipe down with something wet first, because you can easily wipe down the full stem, the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf. After that, let them dry completely and then give them a spray down with your pest spray of choice and make sure you repeat that at least one more time one week later in order to make sure that you fully eradicated all of the pests and make sure you're spraying the top of the soil and the pot as well because pests can be hanging out on the pots and on the top of the soil. So let's talk about repotting next. So you wanna check your alocasias once per year to see if they need to be repotted, but you wanna wait to repot them until they're significantly root bound and you wanna only go up one pot size. And for alocasias, the best time to propagate them is actually when you're repotting them. And that's because these plants cannot be water propagated. They can't be propagated from leaf cuttings or stem cuttings. They really can only be propagated three ways and only two of them are practical for most people. So I'm gonna cover those two first. And the first one is division. And division can be done if the plant is mature enough and if there's basically enough of the plant to divide. So once again, let me grab my Bambino because there are two plants actually in this pot. So you can see the two separate stems down here for the two separate plants. So if I was repotting this plant, I could just very gently divide right along here, separate the roots out on these plants, and then pot them up into separate pots. But if you have a plant such as my Alocasia Tiny Dancer here that is only one stem, that is not going to be dividable yet. But that doesn't mean that you can't still propagate it while repotting it. And so let's move on to the second way that you can propagate these plants while repotting. So as I mentioned earlier, they grow from corms. So I showed you the corm earlier from my black velvet alocasia. So that one I showed you is on the surface of the soil and they can appear that way sometimes. But typically there's gonna be corms underneath the soil mixed in with the roots and you're gonna find those when you're repotting. So just go gently through the soil, just kind of feel around till you can find those. And you wanna find the biggest ones possible, preferably around the size of like a macadamia nut would be the smallest that you would wanna to try to propagate with. But if you can find those, go ahead and pull them out. Once you've pulled those out, those can either be put directly into soil or you can actually propagate them in water by doing a method where you're basically halfway submerging them in water, letting them develop there first. And then once they actually have a leaf or two, you would move them into soil. And when you're putting corms into soil, whether it be directly into soil or from water into soil, you wanna make sure you're only burying that corm one inch below the soil surface. They do not need to be super deep. In fact, they do not like to be super deep. Now I realize that's just a really broad overview of propagating with corms, but don't worry, I actually am in the process of creating a corm propagation specific video for you guys in which I go into way more detail and show you firsthand the full process. Now, as I mentioned, there are three ways you can propagate them, but the third one is probably the most complicated of all. I've never attempted it. I really have zero interest in attempting it, but you you could do it if you wanted to, and that is by harvesting the seeds from this plant and pollinating them. And that's about all I'm gonna say on that topic in this video, because that is a much more complicated process and that definitely would require a whole other video on its own. But while we're on the subject of seeds and pollination, let's talk about flowers because alocasia do flower. They are not the most attractive flowers, however, as you're seeing here. And when they flower, the plant will start to sacrifice leaves for those flowers. So you will see what's happening on my Bambino, who flowered recently, start to happen. And so this plant has a lot of brown spots on the leaves. It was doing that when it started to flower because it was getting ready to sacrifice some of the older leaves. 
that is not from an underwatering situation. And so you'll see leaves start to do that and then they'll turn completely yellow, they'll droop down and they'll die. If you don't wanna be losing a lot of leaves in that situation, just cut those flowers off as soon as they come in. You don't need to leave them there and that will help prevent the plant from sacrificing leaves and hopefully will encourage it to continue to just put out new foliage. And while we're on the topic of leaf loss, it is also not uncommon for at least one of the older leaves on an alocasia to die when a new leaf comes in. It doesn't always happen that way, but on a lot of them it will. So don't get concerned if every time a new leaf comes in, one of the oldest leaves dies. It might just be part of the natural leaf life cycle for the plant. So I just had to pause for a second because Toby, my cat, walked through here, but perfect timing on his part because I want to talk about toxicity next for these plants. These plants are unfortunately toxic to both dogs and cats, and if a human ingests enough of it, also a human. So definitely make sure you're keeping your alocasia out of reach of any pets that like to eat plants or small children who might not know better and might want to nibble on a plant. So once again, not the easiest genus of plants to take care of, but they are so beautiful and it is so rewarding if you can get the care right. So I really do hope this video has helped you out today. If it has, please hit that like and or subscribe button down below. And I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Aloha.